Um, if you've been joining us for the past two weeks, that means you got to hear some two awesome messages about the Holy Spirit. You know, we believe that there's God the Father, there's God the Son, there's God the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, so if you ca caught us two weeks ago, John Bevere, world-renowned speaker, world-renowned writer, uh, really a good man of God. You know, uh, I, I have the privilege of calling him my friend. And um, he delivered a message on the person of the Holy Spirit, introducing us, reintroducing us to the very person of the Trinity that we are most intimately acquainted with. And he said, it's not about what the Holy Spirit is, it's about who the Holy Spirit is. And he gave an awesome message and it just, it, it, it penetrated, I know it penetrated my heart to like the deepest of my core. And it's been changing my life, reading his book, uh, the Holy Spirit and introduction has just been changing my life. Uh, just how I interact with God, how I interact with this Holy Spirit. And then, then Pastor Carl comes in and he just knocks it out of the park last week. And he's talking about the relationship, having a relationship with the Holy Spirit, how to pursue it. I mean, these guys are legends. They're amazing. And, and how do you follow up after these guys? But um, I'm going to do my best. And I realize that I just want to give God the glory. Amen. Uh, there's this thread that's going to be just kind of going through every single one of our teachings and uh, on this series about the Holy Spirit. And quite honestly, I think this is a thread that should be in every single teaching that is preached from this pulpit and this church. It's relationship. Relationship with God. Because God, let me tell you right now, whether you know it or not, God desires an absolute relationship with you. You know, you parents in the room, uh, you have your kids, and uh, there's, there's a motivation beside be, you know, behind having kids. I mean, there's fun and never mind. But anyway, uh, that, that was a, no, I'm not gonna go there. You're already filled in the blank. But anyway, we have kids, why? Because you desire the relationship with that person that you haven't even met yet. You desire this relationship with, with this person. And, and so you have kids. And, and I believe this, as like one day when I have my kids, they're gonna be the coolest people that I ever meet in my, in my entire life. I'm convinced of it. They're gonna be the best, coolest people that I, I will ever meet in my entire life. And then they're gonna become teenagers and I'm gonna be the least cool person that they have met in their entire life. I'm ready for that. <laughs> All you parents were like, no, no, you ain't ready for that. You are not ready for that. Uh, you're gonna eat your words, Pastor Frank. But anyway, um, I know that, that these people, I, I'm looking forward to the relationship that I'm gonna have. And, and get this, God has created us in His image. There are attributes and features of us that is in our God the Father. And if, if we in parenting desire a relationship with these people, how much more, how much more infinite? I mean, God's love never ends, never ends. It doesn't end at death. It doesn't end at sin. It doesn't end. It is endless and it's infinite. And God loves us so much and he wants a relationship with us. So there's just gonna be this thread that just goes through our, throughout this teaching. You're gonna hear it over and over and over. Um, and it's gonna be a good one because it is in this relationship with God. It is in this relationship with God that life transforms, amen? So let's pray. You ready? All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much just for this day, the fact that we can get into this place, into this tent, Lord, and worship you. That we are, we are called worthy by your sacrifice, Lord, on the cross, that we are called worthy to just be able to worship you, to raise our hands to you. It doesn't matter what we sound like or look like. We get to be in your presence. What an opportunity and a privilege it is to worship the living God. Holy Spirit, I'm praying right now for each and every person in this room that we would have way more than just the teaching today, that we would have way more than just a pregame kind of, kind of preparation today. But instead, God, I'm praying for transformation in this place for every single person in this room, that we would not leave the same person, but instead be transformed into someone that knows you more and more clarity and understands you more and loves you more and grasps onto this relationship with you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place, this little tent in Kaneohe, this leaky tent in Kaneohe, this beautiful, beautiful church, Lord, that we would invite you, Holy Spirit, into this place and that we would feel your presence burning inside of us, that we would feel and acknowledge your presence and your transforming nature, Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' mighty, precious, awesome name. Church, we all say, amen. All right. Well, we're going to get right on this. Camera guy, you're going to go nuts tracing me. But anyway, uh, yeah, have you ever experienced a game changer in life? Like things just, something just changed and it just like, bing, the, the light bulb goes on in your life. You're just like, man, there's no going back after this. Have you ever experienced that before? 
Yeah, some of you, all right, like, like when you're dating and you're, you're a couple, and there's that moment where you go in for the kiss, game changer. You know, I, used to, I have a friend who said, you know, uh, when people would say, oh, you know, I don't know if this girl likes me. He says, well, just go try kiss her. See, <laughs> I don't know, that'll prove it. I don't know if that's good advice, you know, like trying to kiss every girl you like or whatever. But um, there, there's, there's game changers in this life. And I work at this little restaurant called Bucca di Beppo. It's in town. Yeah, it's good stuff. Um, there's this, this Italian restaurant in town. It's family style. It's great food. Um, it, will, it, it will make you fat, but um, it's good. It's good. I love the food there. I eat it all the time. And... Um, I just recently became a server there, so you know it would be fantastic to have this entire church asking for Pastor Frank. You know, well, not, not, they, nobody knows me as Pastor Frank over there, but you know, yeah, I want Frank section. But anyway, yeah, that's my little plug for that. But anyway, so I was working on my second job. I was working at Buca di Beppo, and uh, I was doing takeout that day. And there's, there gets to these moments where it just gets boring. You know, there's, there's nobody coming in. Like, I'm just kind of like doing my thing. And I have this obsessive compulsive nature to do this with my phone. I do this all the time. Like if my phone's in my hand, I'm just, I'm twirling it. You know, I'm just, oh, I'm twirling it. You know, I'm dancing. I'm, I'm, but but I, I have this thing and I, I just do this all the time. And so I was doing this at takeout and I was standing there. I'm just doing this. And it just kind of dawned on me. I'm a geek like this, you know. I just looked at it and I go, I stopped. My coworker was right next to me. I said, wow, do you remember when phones had buttons? <laughs> I just marveled about weird stuff like that. You know, like stuff like the automatic window on your car. I mean, I just, I'm like, oh, this is so, that's cool. You know, I, I just, I don't take things for granted. I mean, so I was looking at my phone. I'm like, remember when there was, no, when there were, remember, uh, Remember when I could talk? <laughs> remember when there was buttons on phones? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, do you remember when your Nokia could last for days without a charge? Or you could just go days. It's like that little phone was a marathon runner. You look at it, you go, man, remember when the coolest game you had on your phone was Snake? It's like you look over and you go, man, whoa, that is state of the art. You have, you have a game on your phone? That's wild. But anyway, so I was geeking out over the fact that there's no buttons on these phones. Did you know that, that it doesn't even go, even go by pressure on these phones? It senses the electric like current in your hand, and that's how it knows that you're touching it. That's cool. I used, I used to love Star Trek. That's a lie. I love Star Trek now. <laughs> So anyway, I, I loved watching Star Trek as a kid. And so the, the cast and the, and the characters, they'd always have these tablets and they would control the ship just by pushing on these screens and touching them. And I'd be like, wow, that is so cool. Like, imagine, it, what? <laughs> Star Trek is happening. But anyway, before I got a smartphone, I, I probably had a dumb phone. And um, so people would tell me like, oh, you, you need an iPhone. You need, a, you need a smartphone. I'm like, I don't need no smartphone. I just need, I, what I want my phone to do is dial my friend and I talk to them. That's all I need to do. Maybe text message every once in a while. I don't need a, a smartphone. I don't need a phone that does it all. I don't, whatever. But there's apps. I don't care. I don't need that. I'm not even going to use that. Then my dumb phone took a nosedive and it died. My beautiful little razor died. My button phone died. So I was like, well, I guess I'll have to get a smartphone. So I got one. And then I realized when it was in my hands, like I just spent like a couple hours lying on my bed, just like, oh. And I seriously, I was like, how does it know? Like, how does it know when I'm touching it? Like, that's amazing. I just I was just going through all these apps. I'm like, there's apps for everything. It won't cook dinner for me, but it'll teach me how to cook dinner. Amen. And suddenly, the advertisement and the words became proof. 
and experience. And then I realized, man, there ain't no going back to no dumb phone after this. I, I, I need these smartphones. Like, this is amazing. And, and it was until I experienced it that I didn't, I, I didn't realize what I had. And, and so as I was studying for this teaching, and this, this teaching is about finding the, the, the proof of a relationship with God, it got me asking the question, well, what do I look for? And how can I know that I'm experiencing a relationship with God's Holy Spirit? So that's where we get into the verse. And it's, it's Galatians chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 17 to 23. And usually when, when a pastor or a teacher covers this verse, it's talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Usually you start at verse 22. But I kind of wanted to set a groundwork and put into context and just kind of lay it out a little bit further than that. So I'm going to rewind it to uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. And so the first part, the, the first verse, we'll just tackle that for now. It says, the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. Now I want to pause just there for a moment and just kind of attack and just kind of tackle this sinful nature nature because a lot of times as Christians especially we want to hold sin as far away as possible good luck I mean you know we sin all the time uh, in one way or another but sometimes we, we look at this and it says like the sinful nature it's like ooh I don't ooh, I don't want I don't want that I don't, I don't want to even tackle that or or uh, that's not really me like I'm trying to get over stuff I don't, I don't want to tackle sinful nature but if I can just kind of extend our minds for a moment and just read it a little bit different, if I can do that. The human nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. Yes, humans are really good at sinning. We are. We're, we're prone to flaw. We're prone to fall. We stumble really easily. And, uh, and the reason why is because we're not God. We aren't God. And so we're kind of prone to that. See, God created the world. And when he created it, he had intentions for it. He had design for it. Um, but sin entered the world and it's like infected the world. It's, we live in a broken world. Nobody can deny that. You turn on the news and it just, it just paints a picture of a broken world. It's a world that's, that's going through stuff and it's, it's repercussions from uh, the sin that has entered it. And so this, this human nature has now a sinful nature and it continues on it says and the spirit gives us everyone say gives yes. the spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires these two forces are constantly fighting each other so you are not free to carry out your good intentions verse 18 but when you are directed by the spirit you are not under the obligation to the law of moses when you follow the desires of your sinful nature the results are very clear. Get ready. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. See, the writer didn't even finish a sentence with listing all the different sins. Because you know why? Because our, our human nature and us humans, we're really good at something. We're good at being creative, of finding new ways to sin. So in this verse, he just says, this, 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 oh my gosh, my hand is cramping, and other sins like these. Because it's just, there's just this long list. I mean, it's always growing. It goes on, it says, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now in this verse behind me, there's little brackets there because uh, you might be sitting in the chair going, wait, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I believe that I am an inheritor of the kingdom of God because I love Jesus. But this verse is saying, if I live this life, I can't inherit the kingdom of God. And I just wanted to kind of just expand on it a little bit. And I'm, I'm just saying this, like the author, the writer is saying, anyone living that sort of life, and let me extend and just say, and ignores God will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, we live in a world where people just aren't even aware that God exists or they, they look at God and just say, mm, ah, I don't want that. And so that they are not able to inherit the kingdom of God. And so the writer is saying that this is not the way to inherit the kingdom of God. It's not about living what the world lives. And it goes on, verse 22, things get really hopeful here. Things get really positive. Things get really real here. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces, everyone say produces, this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, 
patience. I want to I just expand on patience for a little bit because this is not patience. This is not you standing in the DMV line waiting to either A, get your license or B, renew your license and you go and you stop and you look at everyone else and you're like, wow, that person's, that person's on their smartphone and they're playing games. Here I am just standing. Boy, I'm patient. Boy, I am patient. That person's on their dumb phone over there text messaging. I'm just, I'm just waiting. Oh, Holy Spirit, you're pouring on me right now. I'm patient in this line. No, I'm not talking about that kind of patience. The patience that is spelling out there is the long suffering patience. That means, that means the times where you're going through the worst time of your life. You don't know how you're going to get through it, but somehow the Holy Spirit is producing fruit in you. And the Holy Spirit is saying, you know what? I'm going to stir up this patience in you. It's the patience that you're able to go. You know what? I'm in the storm right now. I'm, I'm hurting right now, but I'm going to hold on to God and God, I'm going to hold on to you. You're going to hold on to me. And we're going to do this holding on thing together. And I know that I'm going to get through this and there's going to be a victory at the end of this. And I'm going to rejoice amidst the trouble, amidst the pain. And I'm going to know that God, you got something cooking up right now. I may not see it soon. I may not see it in this next year. And you know what? When I look at the experiences of a lot of people in the Bible, some of them didn't even see the victory within their life. But praise God that it's not about this life, but it's about the next. This is just the preview of the main attraction. This is just the pamphlet to the amusement park. This is just the preview to the cool movie that's going to unfold. All right? This is just the preview. And it's, it's about saying that patience is saying, God, I'm going to wait and I'm I'm going to stay here and I'm going to love you and you're going to love me and I'm going to wait for you to shine in this life. Amen? Amen. That's what it says when it says patience. And then it goes on to kindness and this kind of kindness. Uh, there's three, three things in the fruit of the Holy Spirit that kind of, they blur together. And so I, I kind of want to spend time on each of them. There's kindness, there's gentleness and goodness. Sometimes we look at those and go, well, there's not much difference there. See, when the original language, when it's talking about kindness, it's talking about the sympathetic kindness. It's talking about the kindness where you have a friend that is in that storm and you're looking at it going, man, they're in a storm right now. It's that kind of kindness that wells up inside of you and burns inside of you where you're like, you know what? I'm gonna be here with you right now. I'm gonna stand this storm with you. You're not going through the storm alone. This is gonna be you and me, and we're gonna journey through this together, and we're both gonna have our eyes on Jesus because we're gonna walk through this together. It's that kind of kindness. It's a sympathetic kindness. It goes on, it says, goodness. This is goodness in action. Very often, it's benevolent goodness, all right? Maybe you walk to work or, or you go to work every day and you see the same, that the same person who's living on the street and you walk by them, but, but there's just one day where you walk by and you go, man, Today's different. Today's different. The Holy Spirit is doing something in me and I'm not, I cannot take another step. I'm going back to this person saying, hey, hey, I want to bless you. I want to bless you. It's the kind of goodness that stirs in us to sponsor 927 children in the Philippines on the back of that wall. 927 kids are blessed because the Holy Spirit wells inside of us and is just moving us to do something good. You following? All right. It goes on and it says, faithfulness, gentleness. This is the gentleness in, in, this is humility in the face of opposition. See, we got to put ourselves in the, in, in, in the shoes of 2,000 years ago as an early believer, early Christian. Because that's, that's what the writer's talking about. And, and just to kind of spell out what this gentleness looks like, it's the gentleness that, see, when we tell people we're Christians at work, I mean, the worst that can happen is people ridicule us, people may tease us, they might throw around a little bit more jokes around us, you might feel a little ashamed. But this is not knocking on your door of your house, dragging you out and killing you. This is what the Christians faced at that time. See, they had to have the Holy Spirit. They had to have proof of the relationship of the Holy Spirit that was just unexplainable. And they had to have that gentleness that came alongside. They had, they had to have the gentleness of Jesus. See, a lot of times we think Jesus went to the cross and it's like, yes, the cross is a big deal. I'm not diminishing the cross in this next statement that I'm gonna make. But it wasn't just the cross. I mean, Jesus went through life. Jesus went through puberty. I mean, Jesus probably had acne at one point, you know, and there's this, this but even, even greater than that, before he knew that he had to hang on a cross naked, he was gonna get beaten, ridiculed, and spit on. That's a crazy thought to me. 
that not only do you have to stomach, as Jesus, a human who's afraid of what's going to happen, he's like his last night, he knows what's going to come in a few hours. He's like, tomorrow is going to be a big day. Tomorrow's going to be a hard day. I'm going to hang up on a cross tomorrow. But not only that, it was just like being able to process tomorrow, I'm going to be stripped down and, and people are going to beat me and spit on me and ridicule me. Gosh, what power of that Holy Spirit to, to, to answer that, not in retaliation, but in humility. I mean, if I was Jesus, if I was Jesus, which I'm not, I mean, if first punch, I would have been like, what? Let's do this. You know what I mean? Jesus probably didn't even have to raise a hand to hit anyone. With the heaven's armies at his beck and call, I would have just been like, you know what? I am done. Angels, Come now, take all these cats out. I want lightning here, here, and here. Let's fry these suckers. You want to punch me, you want to spit? Boom, you're all dead. Done. But see, what, what Jesus did is he said, you know what? Forgive them, Father, for they, they know not what they do. That's the kind of gentleness. Can I, can I spell that out? That's the kind of gentleness that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It goes on as the last one, self-control. At the last service, someone was like, amen, that's a, that's a big one. And I'm like, yeah, amen. Self-control comes from the Holy Spirit. There is no laws against these things. Those who belong to Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. You ever notice that people kind of rub off on each other? You ever seen that before? You see friends rub off on each other in good and bad ways. You know, if you, if you observe and, um, and research and, you know, kind of like the nature channel, if you just watch couples, they, they, they somehow start talking like each other. Sometimes they create baby talk that is just like, it's sickening to everyone else. But to them, it's like, oh, you know, and they just start rubbing off on each other. My parents recently have got, gotten into Korean dramas. My dad is Filipino and my mom is like full Portuguese. And they've gotten into these Korean dramas. They're like addicts. Um, and my mom's learning Korean now. And they, they, they start speaking to each other. My mom talks to the dogs in Korean. I've given, I've made, I've made the mistake of giving them access to my Netflix account. Netflix now thinks I love Korean dramas. They go on it and Netflix is all Korean dramas now. And I'm like, seriously? What happened to the cool movies that I used to like? But they're just rubbing off on each other and they're both nuts. They're just both crazy. I mean, that's not a new, now it's a new type of crazy. They were crazy before, but now it's a new type of crazy. I love them. God bless them. They gave me life. Like, they, you, go ahead. You do your K-drama stuff. But you ever notice that, that couples and people just rub off on each other, friends, family. It made me kind of look at this verse and this talking about the fruit of the Spirit. It made me think, could it be that the fruit of the Spirit, the stuff that God wants to bring about in us, is in fact characteristics of God the Father and God the Son through the Holy Spirit. And I was like, wow, I think so. And it made me also think, what would it be like, what would it be like to allow the Holy Spirit to rub off on you just a little bit more? What would it be like? What would work be like? What would school be like? Because I believe this. Here's my, here's my thought, that the entire world is looking for their creator and their entire world is looking for their savior, but they just don't recognize him or they do not acknowledge him yet because they haven't seen him in his full glory. So what would it be like, church, if we spent way more time with the Holy Spirit and allowed him to rub off on us? Because that's just how humankind is. We rub off. And to allow him, his character to rub off on us, what a beautiful sight that would be. What a beautiful sight. I went to uh, Waikiki a couple weeks ago. A couple weeks ago and um, there was this lady, I could just hear her screeching, like screeching. I'm like, what's going on? She was just yelling, ah, ah, 
ah! I'm like, oh my gosh, someone is crazy all up in here. But then I, I kind of ran over. I run like this, <laughs> oh, like a crab. Um, but I ran over and I was like, what's going on? And she said, I'm looking, I'm looking for a little boy. He's, he's a little boy. He's wearing all blue and his, his hair is blonde and it's fluffy. And, and, and his name is, I forget his name. I'm just going to go with Stuart right now. His name is Stuart. And, and I'm looking for him. Man, I haven't run so fast and yelled so loud in my entire life. I was barefoot and I didn't even care. I hate being barefoot. I hate being on cement barefoot. It just, it feels dirty to me. I don't like it, but that didn't matter. I knew that this mom was looking for her son. I knew that this father was looking for their son. They were looking for their lost children and they were running and their voice was going and it was just like gone. But I know that I can project my voice really well. And I started yelling at the top of my lungs. I was yelling and I was running back and forth for like 30 minutes, just running, yelling. Went to McDonald's. I'm like, have you seen this boy? Other people started coming. They're like, are you looking for your son? I said, no, no, it's not my son, but, but it's, it's this lady down there, but I'm looking for him. And let me describe what he looks like. And, and, and can you help? And so after a while went by, these kids, they bike over on their bikes. This is how they bike because they're from the hood. Um, <laughs> But they, they biked on over there and said, we found him, we found him. But see, I wasn't satisfied. I kept running and I kept looking. And until I saw the dad and I looked at him in the eyes and I said, did you find your son? Yes, we did. And I'm like, praise God, awesome. You guys have a beautiful vacation. But I knew at that moment, it, it kind of struck me. I'm like, isn't that how we're supposed to look for God's lost children? And, and it, it didn't matter if I looked like the parent or not, I just, I knew that I was just going to search as hard as I could to help these parents out. But see, on my own steam, I can only look so long. I, I realized a very sobering fact. It was like, there's going to be a point in time I can't run anymore. I can't yell anymore. And I, I won't look anymore. And I'm like, God, what, a, what an idea, what a thought. I'm like, God, I need your steam and your strength and your character. And I need to look like you to reach your lost kids, to find your lost kids. I need you. I need you so bad. So what would it look like, church, if we spend more time with the Holy Spirit and let him rub off on us? I bet you people would start looking at you in the way that Jesus was looked at and just saying, there is something different. You're not, you're not just happy. You look different. I don't, I don't even realize it, but I'm, you're what I'm looking for. Why? Because you're looking for Jesus. What a thought. What a thought. I have a confession. I hate speed bumps. I despise speed bumps. Don't worry. It ties into the sermon. I'm not just going on a weird tangent. I hate speed bumps. They just slow me down and I don't like them. I, on Friday night, I looked at Pastor Carl. He was in the front row. And I just said, Pastor Carl, I hate our speed bumps on this campus. They're just the worst. Um, it, but af afterward, I was kind of thinking about it. I don't hate all of our speed bumps on campus. I just hate the ones at the bottom. Because yes. I feel like Hercules is lying down and your car goes over and he goes, gotcha, sucker. <laughs> it's like, oh, and it's like, speed bump. Because it's just like they're short speed bumps and it just like jolts your car and you're like, oh my gosh, like what the heck just happened? But, but I like the speed bumps up here. They're polite speed bumps. <laughs> the ones up here, they're polite. And here, let me explain why I think they're polite. Because, because it's like they look at you and just go, hi, I'm a speed bump, slow down. And if you slow down fast, like good enough, you can pass over me and I'm not even there. Like you can straddle your car's wheels over the speed bump. They're polite speed bumps. They're like, hey, hey, slow down. Oh, bye. <laughs> the speed bumps that I hate, one of the most speed bumps that I hate, absolutely hate on this island, Hilton Hawaiian Village. I don't care if you work there right now. I'm just going to say right now, you got the worst speed bumps, like the worst. They have these elevated crosswalks, okay? They're elevated. Now, this means there's a hump and there's a crosswalk on top of it, elevated crosswalk. Now, if you're a driver, and, I, and here's where I need some interaction. If you're a driver and you see an elevated sidewalk, what are you gonna do? Five of you know what to do to a speed bump. <laughs> this is disconcerting. This is scary. Okay, okay. If there's an elevated, <laughs> there's somebody at the last service, he's saying, you know what I would do? I would launch that sucker. <laughs> I'm like, I like that. So, okay, well, once again, elevated crosswalk, what do you do before it? 
Someone said speed up, <laughs> slow down. Okay, so you slow down, you know? It's like speed up, like boom, boom. what was that? A speed bump? No, pedestrian. <laughs> but anyway, so obviously I'm gonna slow down for an elevated speed bump, but Hilton Hawaii Village doesn't think I'm gonna do that. What did they do? They put a speed bump in front of the elevated sidewalk. I'm like, what? And John Bevere and I, so I had to drive John Bevere to his hotel. He was staying at the Hotel Wine Village. I had the privilege of driving him back and forth. Really cool because I, get to, I just got to befriend someone who, you know, he could get a big head about himself and be like, I'm world renowned and whatever, but he's just real. And that's why I like just driving him. I, I'll just drive him all over the place. But we were both complaining about the speed bumps. We're like, he's like, what is the deal with these speed bumps? And I'm like, I don't know, John. <laughs> Brace yourself, John. Here's another. It's like, what do we do? Off-roading, you know? Like, I hate those speed bumps. They're, they're just the worst. But even more than those, even more than those wretched speed bumps at Hilton Wine Village, you know what speed bumps I hate the most? The ones that slow me down to accessing my God. They're the speed bumps that when I look in the mirror and, I, and, and the thoughts into my mind go, well, Frank, you're too flawed or you're such a sinner or you've done this or you've done that. Or when I go to work and, and it just seems like, oh, this person's so hard to reach or this person's too antagonizing, this person's too annoying or whatever it is. I hate those speed bumps. See, God wants to transform us. He doesn't want to transform us so that he can tolerate being in the same room with you. Okay? It's not, like, it's not like when I say, God, would you spend time with me? And he goes into the room with me and he goes, oh gosh. Oh, Frank. Oh, I need to transform you because I, I just can't take you. I just can't take you. That's not the way our God operates. We sang it this morning. His love never ends. His love never ends. Our God loves us, loves us, exclamation point, loves us. See, he wants to transform us, why? Because he's looking for his kids in the world and he wants us to have better access to him. He wants us that when we look in the mirror and we say, oh man, I'm so flawed. He wants us to have access to him and iron out those speed bumps. So, so instead of hearing that, we hear, no, 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 you're good. You're doing, you're doing better than you think you are. Oh man, this, this, this coworker's so hard to reach. No, they're not, no, they're not. You just gotta tell them this. You just gotta pray for them this way. He wants to level things out and transform us so that our nature is more like his nature and that he can speak to us more clearly, more loudly. That's why. And that's why he wants to transform our lives. Is this good so far? Yeah. I think we get into a bad habit of uh, creating checklists in our life. So the reason why I really accentuate the fruit of the spirit, because sometimes we think it's fruits of the spirit and it becomes a checklist. But when we say fruit of the Spirit, that means I just gotta spend time with the Holy Spirit and He's just gonna bring these things out. But we're so used to checklists. We're used to to-do lists, grocery shopping lists. We're used to the rating game. You know, um, I've been abstaining from Facebook and Instagram this week and all media altogether. Haven't had the pleasure of looking at the Netflix and being like, wow, look at how many K-dramas are watching this time. I've, I've just been avoiding that. The reason why is because I really wanted to spend more time with the Holy Spirit. If I'm gonna teach about Him, I gotta spend time with Him. And so, uh, but what I've noticed about Facebook, Instagram, and all that social media stuff is that, you know, it's just the rating game. How many likes can I get with this one? Oh man, everyone likes my photo. I'm a photographer. <laughs> everyone likes my joke. I must be a comedian. Everyone likes my, my, my spiritual guidance. I'm a theologian. It's all about likes and stuff like that. And, 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 you know, even if you're not on social media, maybe you're like, I don't even go on social media. You've lost me, Frank. Well, how about when you're a kid and you're graded on all your work? A, B, C, D, whatever. Now, this is not me saying I, I'm against the grading system because I think kids should aspire to greatness. And I think when they're bringing home something that is troubling, it's, it's not necessarily the kid's fault. It's not necessarily the, the teacher's fault. I think it's time to sit down with your kid and, and figure out what's going on and, and, and coach your children and, and to say, hey, how, how can we get through this together? Because let's aspire to greatness because we're working for God, not just ourselves. Amen. Um, but we're so accustomed to this rating game and somewhere along the lines, we assume that God plays the rating game and he doesn't. There is no checklist. There's no rating game for him. It's just relationship. Husbands, if you think you, you, your wife is just a checklist of things to do, you're like, okay, well, I woke up, I said good morning, hugged her goodbye. I came home after work and I gave her a kiss and I said, I love her. Oh man, I'm good. 
I'm good. I'm good. All you girls are like, mm. one word for you, couch, sucker. <laughs> I mean, if you think relationships are just the checklists in life, you've got another thing coming because relationships are a process. Everyone say process. I want to turn your attention to two scriptures. It's, uh, well, one scripture, two translations. Each, Ephesians chapter five, verse 18. Uh, it says this. It says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Another uh, translation, the Amplified Version says this. And do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but ever be filled and stimulated with the Holy Spirit. Now, when we look at these verses, a lot of times we lock in onto the do not part. The do not do this. Oh man, I better not do that because I don't want to offend God. I don't want to make him upset. I don't want him to like me less. But when you get to a translation like this and you get that word debauchery, one, that's a big word. And two, it makes it sound even worse. So you're like, oh man, I really got to avoid that because it's debauchery, you know? But what I really think the, the prime rib, the meat of this verse, if you're vegetarian, like the tofu burger from heaven of this verse, is, is the second part. It says, but ever be filled and stimulated with the Holy Spirit. But ever be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, it's about a con continuous process with Him. It's continual. See, if you go out and buy a car today and fill the gas up, once and expect to travel the world and see new things on one tank of gas, you're a fool. And it's the same way with God. If we think we're going to get through this life, just like, oh, I'm going to fill up with God once and then, all right, I'm good. No, no, no. Human nature says otherwise. If you have a friend that you've been close with, years go by without you ever talking to them without you ever knowing whether are they married or if they have kids or how are they doing and stuff like that. If you, if you do that, what happens to the relationship? It distances because that's how us humans are. We distance. God's not like that. God is not like that. He doesn't distance from us, but he, he's saying, be ever filled with my Holy Spirit. Be ever filled with my Holy Spirit. Here's why, son. Here's why, daughter. Because I'm not gonna go anywhere. I'm gonna be right here with you but if you don't stick close to me, you will distance. You're gonna feel distant from me, but I'm right here. So let's be filled over and over and over. Is this a good word so far, church? So I, got, I wanna boast on some, some, of, uh, some friends of mine. I used to be the junior high pastor of this church um, several years ago, and I had this group of boys in my ministry. They started coming to the ministry, and like, you know, face value, they're like your rough and tough kids. They're, I mean, one of them in junior high had tattoos already on his arm. And, I'm, and, and so my, my holy response to that was, oh, Jesus, Jesus, thank you. They're here. Oh, but they're here. Give me the strength to reach these boys. And they would talk during worship. They would laugh in the back. And I would want to worship in the front because I want to be an example because uh, hopefully, you know, there'd be a kid standing next to me and, and maybe they're ashamed to worship, but they look over at me and go, well, I don't look half as stupid as that guy. So I can worship just a little bit more. You know, so I like to be in the front, but over the speakers, over the amplifiers, the electric guitars in a small closed room, I hear these boys just cracking jokes in the back and it's just like boiling my blood. And I'm like, oh, don't they realize what a holy moment this is? During the sermon, they're talking. So one day after all the, you know, I gave my sermon, all the other kids, the, the, the good kids are like, oh man, that was so good, Pastor Frank. I'm like, oh, awesome, awesome. Praise God, praise God. And then I look at the boys. I said, outside now, outside now. So I gathered them outside, right? I said, do you boys know why you're outside right now with Pastor Frank? I said, do you know why you're outside right now with Pastor Frank? <laughs> oh, because we were talking, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you guys were talking. I don't want you talking next time. Next time you're listening to this sermon, you better take notes next time. Do you know why? Because we're disrupting everybody else. Yep. You are disrupting everyone else and everyone's trying to pay attention and get something from God. And you guys are talking and it's distracting me. I don't want you avoiding church next week because I want you to come back. But can you guys be respectful? Yeah, Pastor Frank. Yeah. You know where they are now? You come Friday night, Sunday morning. They're making your coffee. They're filling your water. They're changing out change so that you can get stuff in the vending machines. They're making, they, they're wearing smiles on their faces. 
nobody, nobody can tell me that the Holy Spirit does not transform people. Nobody. These boys that I could not get to worship God, they go on their break. See, when service starts, there's less of an influx of people, so they don't have a lot of people to greet or a lot of people to make coffee for. So now they spend time in the front over here, worshiping their heart out. It's a beautiful sight because I know that God's church needs more men rising up. And I see in this extreme, like these rough and tough boys, this group is growing up and they're gonna be men for God. They're gonna be fathers for God. They're gonna be brothers for God. They're gonna be friends for God. And I rejoice in that. I see their crew growing all the time. They're not perfect. They got, the tattoos are growing all over the place. I mean, it's just like one week, oh, another tattoo. But I'm not saying anything against tattoos, but I'm saying these guys aren't perfect. They're rough and tough. I love it. One time they came up to me, they said, oh, Pastor Frank, we got in trouble. What do you mean you got in trouble? I'm not gonna say what they did, but they got in trouble. I took them in the back over here and so that nobody could see me because I don't want a new person coming to church being like, oh my gosh, did you just see what happened? I slapped their heads. <laughs> they confessed to me what was going on. I said, are you serious? So I, I, I kind of counseled them a little bit, gave them encouragement, and then I slapped them on the heads. I said, do you learn your lesson? Yeah, Pastor Frank. I rejoice, I love these boys. I love these boys like they're my own. You know, I love them so much and they know, and I, I told them today, I looked at one of them, I said, you know what, your life is beautiful, man. I know it ain't perfect, but it's beautiful. He said, oh, it's such an honor to have you in my life. I said, no, you don't even get it. You don't even get it. It's such an honor to have you in my life. Because I see the Holy Spirit moving. See, I'm not just looking at the proof in me, I'm looking at the proof in these boys. I'm looking at the proof in my ministry. We can have proof in my brothers and sisters. They're not perfect, but they're work in progress. Um, and I think that when we acknowledge the process and, and all of this going on with the Holy Spirit moving in us, then we are allowing Him to do an assessment of our life. We're allowing Him to do an assessment of our inventory. Because I think, I think what happens is if we do our own life's inventory, we fall into two camps. We fall into the camp that says, man, I really am terrible. I'm the worst. We dig too deep. Or we're in the camp where we don't dig enough at all. We don't even dig shallow. We're like, man, I'm good. I'm like the best person in the world. You guys don't even know. I'm the best person ever. And everyone around you is like, you're the worst person to be around. If only, cause, if only someone could just like get you to see that, you know? But it's when we partner with the Holy Spirit and, and, and say, God, I'm not perfect. Holy Spirit, I need you to assess me. Then, then when we're the to dig too deep type, he goes, you're doing better than you think you are. And when we're the person that doesn't dig deep enough at all, he goes, let me, let me transform you because I got stuff to tell you and I want to have better access to you. It's time to get an honest evaluation of us and that needs to come from God and God alone. Amen? Um, there's this verse that I think just spells, spells it out clearly. It's Psalm 26 verse two. And it says, put me on trial, Lord. Cross-examine me. Test my motives and our heart, my heart. I had this amazing experience this week. We're gonna be closing up in a little bit. I had this amazing experience this week. See, when John Bevere got up here and he, he talks about having conversations with God and hearing Pastor Carl talk about, you know, he's in the car, he's just talking to God, my ears perk up. My ears perk up because I'm like, I want that. I wanna have a conversation with my Lord. I wanna see the proof and experience in my life. I want that. So this week, like I said, I've just been like abstaining from all, all media altogether. And I didn't even take away the temptation. Like I was gonna delete all the apps on my phone, but I decided, you know what? I, I should have it there so it's tempting enough. So when I catch myself, I'm like, oh, good, good time to like be able to speak to God. I mean, it's, it was harder than fasting from food. That's a problem. <laughs> So anyway, I was fasting from this. I was abstaining from it. I'm like, you know what? I don't want to do that. I just want to, I want to spend as much time with you, Holy Spirit. I want to hear from you because if I'm going to preach on you, I want to hear from you. So I was reading that book by John Bevere and there's this one part that cross-references a verse and it's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. And it's not going to show up on the screens because I'm just going to paraphrase. It just talks about how we can offend God by treating his covenant and cross as commonplace. Now, once again, I'm the dig too deep type. So when I see a verse like that, immediately in my head, I'm thinking, so Frank, you got to stop spitting on the cross by sinning and doing bad stuff. You got you to shape up, son. That's my natural inclination. I'm very hard on myself. But instead of doing that, I realized, wait, 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 wait. Is, this is not God. Holy Spirit, when do I offend you by treating your cross as common and unholy? 
He answered right away. He said, you treat it common and unholy when you think I forgive as common people do. My forgiveness is uncommon. No joke, my eyes went big. I looked at my cat and I said, what a revelation. I said, Crookshanks, did you get that? Seriously, I realized two things in that moment. Number one, that God is serious. He's dead serious about forgiveness. There is no sin he cannot forgive. So it makes me look at myself a lot better, a lot more accurately. And a lot more accurately, I get to look at God. He's serious about forgiveness. Second thing, he's serious about relationship. You know how I know why? It was in the morning. I was just lying on my bed with my book and my, my Bible. I was just kind of like exploring the verses. My hair wasn't done good. My breath probably smelled like garbage. I didn't brush my teeth. My bed was unmade. The house was a mess. I was in my BBDs. I was in my underwear. Don't picture it. You already did. Got you. Ha! Um, but I mean, it was just not a beautiful situation. I mean, I wouldn't invite a person to my house looking like that, like, hey, come on in. <sighs> it was not ready for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It wasn't ready for a God who creates stars by speaking them into existence. The, the song that we sang this morning, he whispers, the stars into existence, I can barely light a match on the first strike. And here's God who makes stars by speaking them into existence. Here's God who is, who is crafting the very oxygen you're breathing right now. Here's God who created everything that you see. And here's God who is in my room hanging out with me. You know someone's family and someone loves you when they don't even care what your place looks like. They just want to be with you. What a God we serve and love. That got me. That's why my eyes went big. What a revelation. What a revelation. Talk about seeing the proof. So I was at Buka the other day. My last story. We're going to close up with this. So I know you got a game to watch. I was at Buka the other day and uh, just in the middle of work. And the way I work is I want to just bring glory to God. I work really hard because I'm doing it for God. I always just remind myself I wouldn't have a job if not for God. And so, and, and everything I do, I want to shine. So if somebody just is able to look at me and go, man, that guy's working hard right now. Like I, I try to, I try my best. I fail sometimes. Okay. I'm not perfect, but I try my best to go above and beyond expectation because I'm working for God. Okay. So I'm working and, I, and, and, and uh, I end up working extra and I, I did it unknowingly. I didn't know I was supposed to, you know, at the end of the night, you help carry plates out. I just kept carrying all the plates that were coming. And they're like, Frank, why are you still here? You were like cut two hours ago. Why are you still here? I'm like, I just keep running the plates, man. I'm just, it's, it's, I keep doing it. And they're like, you are only supposed to run a portion of it. I'm like, I just kept doing it. And, and anyone else, it seems like anyone else that would be, that would come to, you know, acknowledge that piece of knowledge, they would be like, man, I just wasted my time. But I was just like, okay, well, all right, cool. Why? Because I work for God. And my coworker said to me, you're so positive. You're so positive. And I, and I loved hearing that. I was like, wow, I'm positive. Well, it's because I, I know Jesus. But at the same time, it was, I was very frustrated because on my own steam, the best you're going to get is a positive, nice guy. But see, when I tap into the Holy Spirit, then the power comes because the same spirit that resided in Jesus and allowed him to do the stuff that was just impossible, the stuff that got people healed, the stuff that he was just able to pour into people's lives, the stuff that got mobsters, mafia, drug addicts, I mean, drunkards, I mean, prostitutes, all the, all the scum of the world was just gravitating towards him. The good people were gravitating towards him. This is the Jesus that I serve and this is the Holy Spirit that resided in him and it just attracted. It was 
was in his power that he was able to do the great commission, make disciples of all nations, baptizing the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. See, I think that's a big task, but it becomes easier when we tap into the power of the Holy Spirit. I wish, I wish I had enough time, but you're gonna go watch a Super Bowl pretty soon. I wish I had enough time to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit today because we need that. We need that in exponential amounts. We need that in, in droves. But Pastor Carl's gonna talk about it next week, so you better be here because he's gonna bring it. Was this good? Were you blessed?